Hello, and welcome to the Three Links Oddcast, your podcast for all things having to do with Odd Fellowship. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to a very special episode of the Three Links Oddcast. We are doing a two-part crossover once again with the Modern Goat Riders. So I am your host, Ainsley Heilich, and I'm here with co-host Toby Hansen. And we are joined with our good friend and brother, Billy Sanderson from Columbia Lodge Number 2 in Victoria, British Columbia, and one of the hosts of the Modern Goat Rider podcast. Welcome, brother Billy. Good to have you on the show again. Thank you very much, brothers, and hello to everyone in uh, Oddcast land. It is a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Now, for those of you uh, who are subscribers to the Three Links Oddcast, we're going to be doing the second half of our episode with Modern Goat Rider here. So if you've not heard the first half, be sure and look up Modern Goat Rider in your podcast catcher or just hit up their website, moderngoatrider.com, and you can find the first half of the episode. In that half of the episode, we did a lot of conjecture and uh, prognostication on what might have been different about Odd Fellowship if things had been different in the past. This episode, we are looking at what is going to be different in the future of Odd Fellowship. And uh, Brother Ainsley, what do you have first on your list to talk about there? Well, I think this is something that should be on the minds of every Odd Fellow, and it is what are we gonna do for our first meeting back in person after COVID? Mm, that's a tough one because yeah. some lodges are already back. Some places did not shut down for very long. Speaking from my own experience, it has been frustrating as a member of a lodge that's normally active. It's very exciting to go to my lodge meetings at Buckley Lodge 75 because we're always doing some kind of activity uh, whether it's uh, taco night in November or German dinner in May, uh, the sock drive for the homeless, uh, giving money for skateboard helmets at the skate park. We're a lodge that's always doing things. And last year we shut down after doing a big meeting in March where we initiated five new members. And then we kind of fell off the map. We thought, well, just take a month off and then we'll meet again in May. But then we didn't meet in May. And then finally, there was enough recovery in the state. We were able to do a meeting in October and a meeting in November before things got bad and the state was shut down again. And then we waited and we did a meeting at the end of March and we did the first meeting in April where we were able to install our officers. But now our county has been pushed back to phase two of the recovery plan. So no meetings of over five people. And since we normally get 10 to 15 members out to a lodge meeting, that means we are not meeting. So that creates a real problem for us because we, we come back, we do a couple meetings, we take in a couple applications and then we're not able to move forward after that. And so for us, it's been kind of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And some lodges didn't even bother to start meeting again because they knew that the numbers were going to go back up, the county would be shut back down again. They didn't want to go through that process of starting and stopping the lodge. So from our perspective, it's been challenging because we are basically at the whims of what the governor does, and that's all driven by infection numbers. Yeah, we're, well, we're envious when we look on Facebook and see that uh, there are lodges that are meeting and that they're completing their initiation because we've had, um, uh, we've had Victoria Lodge do one of their initiation, or they did their online one and they got five people through. Uh, Bastion had put 15 women in last uh, meeting right before the shutdown. And Columbia was planning to do 12 candidates uh, the first week that we were shut down. So I know that's going to be the highest pressure. Um, I, 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 I can envision what the meeting is going to be like. And it's going to be 
uh, it's going to be really messy. Like it's going to be a whole bunch of grown, you know, Gen X and older men who are all yeah. huggy and, <laughs> and oh my God, I've missed you so much. Like we had oh, a- Oh, Brother Gordon, <laughs> I missed you. Yeah, oh yeah, Josh. Josh walking around kissing everybody. Like it's yeah. going to be a mess. But yeah. um, the- I would wear a mask to that meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so I think our, our challenge and the Noble Grants challenge that we've been facing is what to do with the scale we're allowed to do. Um, I'm going to bust my wife on this. So last July, uh, she had a birthday and we had a, a backyard birthday party because the rules said you can have this many people and they have to be outside and you need to help. Uh, you need a, um, a COVID plan, like a, you know, what you're putting in uh, to protect the, the, uh, the attendees. So we were kind of treating it like it was a, I don't know, like a car show or something outside what you could be allowed to do. And we had 50 people less one because it was 49 mm -hmm. at the time. But uh, like, I think that's what our meeting is going to be like. It's, it's going to be just a lot of people who are really driven and focused on, okay, let's get back to what wasn't really important to us, which is the social side. We do business. We tackle mm -hmm. business all the time. But I think the first meeting is going to be um, uh, just a challenge from doing what we can do for the 40 or 50 or whatever the number is um, and be inclusive. And because there's 90 members who are going to show up and, you know, if, if our favorite band of the lodge decides to put on a show, there's going to be, you know, we'll sell tickets out in a moment and we'll be well past what we can do. But I think, I think it'll be so positive for each member. Um, it'll just be, how do we pull it off? Because we've, um, we've been, we've just been looking at every exercise as really strange and no precedence. And I hate that phrase that it's unprecedented, but it's really mm -hmm. is. We just have no clue what to do. I mean, 18, 19, and eight, uh, 1918, when they opened up after the Spanish flu, they just opened everything. The whole city just opened up in one day. We went from closed to oh, open, wow. open, and then everybody was back to meetings. You, the minutes just, they only missed five weeks and then we were back open again. Wow. So I don't know. It's, it's just, this, I think it's going to have a lot to do with the size and like Joe, uh, size of your lodge. And like Toby said, you know, kind of how active you are, you can, uh, you can get out and do the work. You just necessarily can't meet. I think one thing that's going to happen is there are certain lodges. I I'm thinking specifically of one I know of in Washington where it's six el elderly people who meet on a Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock. Assuming they're all still alive at the end of this, once the governor says, okay, you can begin meeting again, everything is back open, they will pick up and meet the second and fourth Tuesday of every month, except July and August, just like they always have. I think for a lot of members there is such a strong compulsion to always do exactly the same thing, they'll be able to pick it up just fine. But I wonder in some ways about whether the pause in meetings has harmed our potential for growth. Because we've seen some growth in some areas, even during the pandemic. You know, um, the two new lodges in Louisiana were started before the pandemic, but they were able to finish... Uh, the new lodge in Virginia happened, the new one in New York happened, the new one in New Jersey, uh, and the new one we're going to be talking about on our next episode in Wyoming. Wyoming, of all places, a brand new lodge in the state of Wyoming. And this is something that happened during a pandemic when things were shut down and people had very little access. So... I think for lodges kind of in the middle that aren't just a group of people who've been meeting together for so long, they don't know what else to do on a Tuesday. Those lodges will be fine for the new lodges. They're going to be fine because they've been kind of held back waiting to get out and do things and they will have an explosion of energy when they're able to. But some of the lodges in the middle, you know, where there are people who come to lodge maybe once every couple months, they drop in and see their friends and, you know, maybe they'll go to the school backpack party in August where they prepare backpacks to donate to the local school. 
those are the the members that I think might drift away. We might see some NPDs on those members as they say, well, I'm kind of used to life without going to Lodge, so it does, doesn't matter. I'll stay home and watch more NCIS on Netflix. Really? That's what we need. We need an yeah. Oddfellows NCIS. There we go. Oh, yes. <laughs> I definitely feel like personally with my Lodge, um, there's definitely going to have to be some like rebuilding that we do. Um, we are, we already decided we're not going to do our big event again this year, the odd market. We didn't do it last year because of COVID obviously. And um, if we were going to be doing it this year, we would have already had to have been planning it and that just hasn't happened. But instead of worrying about outward events, um, I feel like the best uh, approach for my particular lodge is to look back inward for a little bit to get that camaraderie going, the bond and, and get the focus on the focus on the F part of F L and T a little bit to kind of just get that dynamic going again. Uh, we've had nine people on deck um, for initiations and I really like got my hopes up for doing a really bomb initiation to get these people in and then hopefully get them on the ground running and start from there as uh, getting the group kind of getting the band back together again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I'm optimistic. I, I think it's going to be those, uh, those new lodge. I, I can just imagine what it'd be like for a new lodge. Like uh, you, you, you're trying to establish yourself very stressful mm -hmm. and noble grands and vice grands that are new, like <laughs> me and my partner, it, it's just like, Oh my God, we're boiling the ocean here. We're just trying to figure everything out. But to have like just this energy that would come in from a, a new group of people that'd be totally game to be involved in something like you might be looking at initiates or, or new candidates or new members that are like, yeah, like, they're they're ready to go like you're just throwing them the football and they're organizing that thing that's in the community because they're just so gung-ho uh, mm -hmm. i think i think that's going to be the best part of it is that there's just going to be this pent-up demand uh, our candidates were very involved right before because we had we'd had so many times that they would meet like they they were always welcome before a meeting and then they didn't attend the meeting they would just wait until we all came out of the hall but um yeah, I think they're just pent up. And it sounds like your guys are too. Your your candidates are as well. Yeah. I I think so. Now, another aspect of this, since there's been a very limited amount of odd fellowship that has been able to go on, I think this is an ideal time to prime the waters for new members. Because Absolutely. One thing that I've seen, I, you know, uh, I'm still junior past grandmaster in my jurisdiction, so I'm still involved with the executive committee here, and I talk to the grand secretary a lot, and frequently she's told me, yeah, I got another inquiry off the website. People are at home alone looking for something to do, and they come to the odd fellows and they say, hey, can we join this? And I think this is a great time for lodges to go out into their communities. If you still have a community newspaper, write up a story, send it to the community newspaper, talking about the lodge, what you do, what you'd like to do, how welcoming you are for new members, put it out there. On your community's Facebook page, I know that there's a, a page for the area in which I live. Or if you're on the Nextdoor app that tells you what's going on in your neighborhood, Put it out there. Hey, um, for those of you who are new to the area, would like to get involved, want to see what's happening in the community, come join the lodge. Now's the time to build the demand so that when we can have meetings again, you can just be sending out one application after the other to people saying, come in, start planning an open house at your lodge, start planning ways, you know, uh, if, we don't have anything approaching normality until the fall plan on having the lodge show up the local high school football game on Friday night, all wearing your lodge t-shirts together. 
come up with a way to make your lodge known and visible both during the pandemic and at the end so that there is pent up demand and people will come in and say, yeah, this is great. I want to be part of this lodge. So that leads to our, that really does segue into the next question, which is, is there pent up demand for odd fellowship? I think so. Yeah. You know, I, I've seen just responses for our jurisdictional website from people asking about it. Um, my lodge has taken in a couple of members when we were able to do a few meetings. I think there's demand. Now, Ainsley, you mm -hmm. are the one who answers emails for the Sovereign Grand Lodge website. What have you seen? I have to say most of the emails I've been getting lately are from people who are kind of like cleaning out their closets and going through stuff because people got, you know, some time on their hands or doing a lot of cleaning. And they're doing that, you know, the Marie Kondo thing. And they're like, hey, I found this ring. Hey, I found this document. And so I try to use that kind of as a moment to be like, hey, that's awesome. Why don't you share it on our community page? And the members can talk to you about it. And we could also help you find a lodge if you're interested. So I feel like there's been a lot of indirect interest just by people finding items and then hopefully from there, they'll get interested. Um, I always do get plenty of emails of people who are looking for their closest lodge. And hopefully they are living in an area where there is one nearby. And I can find the information to then pass on to them. But the interest is there. People are finding stuff. They're watching American Pickers and being like, oh, what's this stuff? Or, you know, they go to the antique shop or they get into the collecting you know, of stuff themselves. And the oddity stuff is really big right now, which odd fellow stuff falls right under that umbrella. And so there's multiple avenues of things that are kind of driving interest to our website. And it's definitely interesting to see the kinds of uh, pages that um, I'm pulling up the stats right now. So just for example, today, um, we've had 547 unique visitors and they've looked at um, about 1500 pages. So that's about three page views per person today. And by far, most of the people have been looking at who are we? They want to know who are the odd fellows. So the who are we page is the big one. And then the next one is lodges near you. So there, there's interest. People want to know who we are, what we do, what we're doing. And I mean, for an organization our size for our website on just a, this is just an average day. This isn't even like a peak day to have, you know, almost 550 people. I mean, we've got a, you know, another hour before it clicks over on my timer for the next day, you know, to have like about 550 people on a regular day looking up, you know, what the heck is odd fellows. That's 550 people that hopefully learned a little something about us and might maybe come back and want to learn a little bit more. And let's, let's say we had a 1% conversion rate. So of those 550 people who looked at the website, what if 1% of them joined a lodge? That's six people per day. I'm rounding up there. Because mm -hmm. we, we can't have five and a half people join a right. lodge every day. Although yeah. we could have 11 in two days. There you go. But, you know, let's let's say that uh, we have a 1% conversion rate on that. That would be really impressive. Imagine if we added five or six new odd fellows every day. Which brings me to another question. Looking ahead to odd fellowship, are our individual lodges available to be found by people who might want to join? And I definitely feel like that is one of the biggest obstacles that we face other than the communication issue that we've waxed poetic on at length is people finding the lodges. And that's where it comes down to having jurisdictional websites that have maps and directories yeah. and contact information and all that stuff. And then it trickles down even further to when people actually show up to these lodges are the lodges doing things in a way that makes it enticing to join 
or do they show up and it's, you know, they're sitting around the kitchen table and they are kind of grumpy and they totally don't want you there. So I, yeah. Okay. I, 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 what I, what I kind of gleam from the interest and this is okay. How, how are they finding out that we exist? Is it just a TV show or another podcast or something? I know you can't ask 500 mm -hmm. people. I get that. But that, the, it's almost like on the website, if you put mm -hmm. at the bottom of who are we, a survey mm -hmm. that said, how did you find out about us? What, like a well, little, a, I don't know if you do that, but if, if there's- I, I have can... refers that show on the website where the traffic is actually coming from. Okay. So most of our traffic uh, comes from search engines yep. and um, mostly off of Google. And they, but I, I think it's more also, important, right? Like we, like you, they you are, go to, yeah, it's, it's, they're just Googling us. Yeah. But really, if they're going to our hair, like you go to a new hairdresser or you, you, you sign mm -hmm. up for a new thing. It says, how did you find out about us? And, and I, I think that might be really important because I found out about odd fellows because I talked to a member and yeah. these people are not like, if they're asking you, is there a lodge in my community? They're not mm -hmm. talking to a member. Like, yeah, no. what is it that has got them so wound up about this? Like, yes, we are not a, not a Catholic church. You can't just walk around the corner and, and be able to find somebody who will tell you where the closest cathedral or yeah. Catholic church yeah. is. Right. So they must be getting something. So if the, if the additional information we can gain and, and empower those who wish to choose, who use choose to use the information is, hey, how did you find out about this? You know, oh well, mm -hmm. you know, I just hit A and E or A and E. There's another old one for you, sorry. But if you hit like pickers, or yeah. like the podcast that we just heard about, like I just I went on to see if I could find the the other odd cast on my uh, on my. Um, my quad chat, my podcast service, and I found a podcast that is in Pittsburgh that has nothing to do with Odd Fellows, and they did an Odd Fellows show, and all they did was basically read the website, like they read almost everything off the website, and then they watched three videos on YouTube and they talked about it. Mm. And if you say, and if you found out, hey, I just found this on whatever, we should be out, we podcasters, we should tell our friends, our members, hey, you listen to a podcast? Do they do society type stuff? Go get on the podcast. Go get on a podcast. Like, you know, I don't want Joe Rogan to say great, wonderful, bad, or whatever things about Odd Fellows, but, you know, like, maybe if, if, maybe if we Joe need a murder Rogan mystery. This is, why we need, this is why we need NCI. We would probably NCIS. end up having the website crash, honestly. <laughs> but, but we need NCIS, right? Because that's what everyone listens to is a murder mystery, like serial yeah. or something, you know. Oh, and yeah. he's an Odd Fellow. Oh, here's a question. If uh, there were an Oddfellows NCIS, would Abby be an Oddfellow or Rebecca? Ooh. Yeah, that's a good question. I would vote Oddfellow. I I think she would fit right in. I could see her as Warden of a Lodge. I've never watched the show. Oh, you've never watched it then? Yeah. Yes, if my my wife has been binge watching NCIS on Netflix recently, so we're we're up to like season thirteen, and I catch some of it. And uh, Abby is this really incredibly brilliant scientist uh, who works in forensics there, but she's also really gothy. Okay, but so you have I, a, odd, you, fellow, odd, odd fellow, odd fellow, totally definitely odd fellow. Odd fellow. Yeah. But you yeah. also have like Peaky Blinders and stuff where it's like completely mm -hmm. the wrong message, but the word is there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. One more stab and it's a federal offense. True. Yeah. That's the wrong, the wrong message to tell. I know. Now, they they made us like the like the real estate mafia on Peaky Blinders, is what it sounds like. Now to That's go Victoria. With, <laughs> to yeah. go with your analogy about uh the odd fellows and the Roman Empire. In that case, mm -hmm. if there's going to be any podcaster talking about us, I want Mike Duncan because he did the history of Rome and it's brilliant and, you know, a very, very highly regarded podcast. So I, I would vote Mike Duncan for uh, 
doing a podcast about the Odd Fellows. I mean, aside uh, from ourselves, of course. Michael Palin. <laughs> I go Michael oh, Palin. Palin Ooh. would be excellent. Yeah, Michael Palin nice. would be fantastic. I'm convinced I'm going to get Ryan Reynolds as an odd fellow. Like, I'm just convinced this guy does so much publicity in Canada about his charity and the yeah. stuff he does. It's just like, how come you and Jim Carrey are not odd fellows yet? Like, we, we can That's do right. this. We could do this. Yeah. You guys could do totally. totally do this. We won't tell anybody. Use a different name. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why why should only tattoo artists be the famous odd fellows? Huh? <laughs> yeah why is it peck and westman (laughs) that sounds like a law firm it does it does llc so how about uh another question um yes we had talked in the past about you go through the old minutes of a lodge and uh you find the mayor of the town members of the town council maybe the police chief uh fire chief other important people stand-up citizens of the community, members of the school board, important local merchants, clergy, they were all members of their lodges. What if that were the case now? How would Odd Fellowship be different if prominent local citizens and or leaders were members of our lodges? I would have to say the the lodges would probably be a lot more active in their communities if that were the case um you wouldn't have the lodges that are just the check writing lodges they would actually be out there doing stuff um because i feel like local leaders join organizations not just to write checks that they do it as almost like a a supplement to get their get their names and their faces out there yeah yeah i agree i i I think there well you certainly would be connected there wouldn't be an excuse that a city event uh was missed by the odd fellows there wouldn't be an excuse for that at all like you would be at the busker festival or every every event that the downtown improvement dis uh association did or whatever um we had a story on that and that's how we got the warming center episode was because this the mayor of victoria does a podcast with our chaplain unrelated to Oddfellows, and she had heard about the vancouver warming center because of the mayor uh basically the mayors talk to each other all the time i guess we have seven mayors in our little area and it's pretty well uh connected and so she posted that this was going on at Va- Vancouver. And so that's how they ended up on our podcast. And then that spawned a massive uh, positive and negative uh, reaction from the membership. So I think if you had somebody who's more connected than just the odd fellow members are, even as a group, um, I think it would be a huge uh it'd be a huge win for the order to be small town or big town to, to just be well-connected. Well, plus somebody like a mayor has, they literally have their thumb on the needs of that community and they will be aware of things that need assistance far better than just the casual citizen who just doesn't have any idea. And I think we have high hopes for our mayors, but yeah, that's the point. They should be informed. Yeah, they, that they would be like, "Hey, we have we have this homeless community that needs this, or we have um, this women's shelter is struggling, and they don't want to say anything to anybody about it, but they need help, or all these things that the people who are in more of like you know the higher up government positions, like on mayor or even like business leaders, might have a better awareness of." what needs assistance in their community versus the average Joe. Now I'm going to take the opposite side of this, which is based on an experience I heard about in another jurisdiction where the mayor of the town belonged to the local lodge. It's a small town. And because the mayor was in the lodge, people who wanted to influence the mayor joined the lodge. 
and there got to be some very political discussions okay. before and after the lodge as various people who wanted to influence the mayor would come in a half hour, 45 minutes before the meeting and say, hey, Mayor Joe, you know that uh, proposal before the city council about uh, tearing down the uh, baby milk factory and building the asbestos mine uh, that uh, I was going to get the construction contract on? I thought that was a really great idea. I just... You know, brother, I wanted you to know that uh, I am all in favor of putting as much aerosolized vermiculite in the air as possible. And I know that as a brother of the lodge, you are too. Now, this was going on before and after the meeting, so it wasn't the kind of thing that should be prohibited in the meeting. After the gavel drops, no politics, no religion. But before and after the meetings, there was a lot of trying to influence the mayor going on. And the mayor got tired of it. And sometimes he would start uh, barking at the people who were trying to influence him. And that led to a lot of conflict that then affected what the lodge was doing. Because now the mayor is bringing his business to the lodge. Other people are trying to influence the mayor. During the meetings, the mayor's like, I don't want to work with that member because he was just haranguing me earlier about... Mm -hmm cutting down all the trees in town and then turning the dog park into a strip mine. And I don't want to hear about it anymore. So although we look at this and go, oh, it would be great. The mayor knows what the shelter needs. It might not be great. It might bring a whole lot of outside political and or yeah. sectarian strife into the lodge. Yeah, it's a good point. I, That's a good so point. Positive and negative to everything. I, I think the, uh, you also have the just the 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 public figure that might have done something unscrupulous, and then that gets attached to the lodge. Yeah. Um, so you have that negative side to it. I I'm pretty sure that you would do like that. Toby's would probably be more likely that by having a political figure, it would be more likely, um, especially a, a mayor or a councilman, you, you might have a, a council person, you might have a, a threat of more influence being waged at the lodge instead of just at, at city hall. Um, and I'm, I'm just, but I think if you had, if you had like the premier member... or the, or the governor of yeah. with your member, you're everybody like, okay, well, we're, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I run a paint shop. I'm not going to influence the governor. Yeah, it's really yeah. cool that he's here. Yeah. I'm looking through the, the naive eyes of the lowly tattoo artists who'd be like, oh yeah, that'd be rad to have like the mayor because then we'd be able to like be a better odd fellows because we'd have a better idea of what the community needs instead of guessing. But no, dude, those are totally terrible valid points <laughs> now don't sell yourself short Ainsley <laughs> you are not a lowly tattoo you artist you are there. probably the 19th most popular tattoo artist in the odd fellows yeah <laughs> there you go. Yes. I, I'm, yeah I mean Shane Simmons right um you know of course Peck and Westman uh, yeah. They're up there. It's a, you know, there's a lot of other great tattoo artists, but don't sell. I might be breaking the top ten but I'm, of the most famous odd fellow tattooers. Maybe. <laughs> but I'm I'm the 21st, and that's a bad sign if I'm at the 21st oh! most popular tattoo artist. Oh no! <laughs> well, I'll give you another example. Back in the old days, so prior to the 1960s, a lot of business of the state of Washington was not conducted in the Capitol building or the executive mansion. It was conducted at the Olympia Elks club mm. because many of the state legislators, the governors, um, they were Elks. And so sitting around at the lounge at the Elks club, downtown Olympia in the state Capitol, that's where a lot of the horse trading and log rolling happened. So, Although we, we think, oh, it'd be great, you know, maybe it would not be great. Um, you know, let's say it is great and the principles of Odd Fellowship always come through and everybody is always kind and charitable to everyone else and they leave politics at the door. But I think we also know there is a possibility of that not happening. So that it could be a potentially 
difficult situation to have all the local leaders and whatnot as members of the lodge. Do you guys in your town, do you have uh, streets named after odd fellows that may have been mayors? Because that's how there's about at least six or seven in Victoria where you're like, oh, why would they name a road Fell Road or Shakespeare um, or Beckwith or whatever? And it's like, well, they were mayors, mm -hmm. but they were also odd. That's fellows. interesting. Well, not not anywhere around me. Um, the only odd fellow I can think of who's had anything named after him around here, uh, the city of Bellevue, which is just east of Seattle, has the Maidenbauer Center. The Maidenbauer family was very prominent, made a lot of money, did a lot of charitable donations. And the original big deal Maidenbauer, the sort of OG Maidenbauer, he was a member of the Odd Fellows in Seattle. So there, there's been a little teeny bit of that, but not much here. Gotcha. What's next, Ainsley? Is it okay going forward to have multiple orders of odd fellows? Good question. That is a good question. So we covered a lot about why there's in the first half. Yes. So you better go back, download your modern goat rider. But I, I'm gonna I mean, obviously, yes. I mean, I... yes. Yeah. Now some, some people would take that as a sign of weakness. Oh, you know, the odd fellows are fractious. They can't get it together. But I look at it differently. When I see the Manchester unity, the grand United order and the independent order, and I see the way that we are spreading and we are overlapping in some cases, uh, like here in North America, we have both independent and grand United order. I think that makes us stronger because it shows that the principles that we all agree on of friendship, love, and truth, even though we may have different ways of teaching those principles, even though we may have different ways of reinforcing them, even though our regalia may be a little different, our traditions, our rituals, even though there are some differences there, the basic idea of coming together to help each other out is compelling. And so I think it's great to have the diversity and the different kind of energy that you get from having different groups of odd fellows. I like that. I think it's a good thing to have. I mean, there used to be dozens of orders of odd fellows. So the fact that we're really only down to a small handful of, of, odd fellow orders left i i think you know we got to keep what we got left alive i mean there's was it the new caledonian odd fellows in was it the southern scotland or something that they only meet once a year and do that nighttime parade like that's awesome i don't yes. are there um billy do you know if there are any of the manchester unity lodges left in can i know they were kind of more prominent in canada or they all they all died off no, I was trying to get some information from somebody in Ontario who knows uh, something about it uh, because there was a, a point that maybe their benefits program was uh, amalgamated with a private uh, benefit program. So they, they just picked up all the clients and they went to uh, like a life insurance or something like that. And they just but kind of sold the assets they off. They just and... kind of sold the assets off. Um, you know, there were three very active, maybe four active lodges in Victoria when we, when the uh, independent order also had five lodges. Um, so yeah, there, I, I think it was booming. Um, but I think their diversion. So my answer is I think the diversion of principles is keeping us from uh, having one order. Mm. Uh, I, I think there is still the basis of what Toby said, which is just the, hey, helping each other. Um, but what I'm understanding about some of the organizations is that they've, they've completely watered down so much of what, you know, what we find interesting that uh, they would be really hard for them to assimilate with our or even the Grand United version of what is an odd fellow, right? So the so if you if you drove from uh, uh, from London 
to mm. Ghana, you would go through three different odd fellow, uh, maybe even four or five, because you would go through Europe. And I know there's mm-hmm. a difference sort of in between, you know, way um, Spain and way uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, looks at odd fellowship. So you would actually go through many different views and opinions of it. So I think we, we are, I would love everyone to be a group, but I think you're right that there's enough diversion and enough uh, uh, specialization on specific aspects of the order or of the principles that it would be really hard to, to kind of keep everybody in line if they were put all into one order. And I, I see on Facebook, you know, every so often people fielding the question of why don't we all just merge into one odd fellows, just odd fellows. And I, I don't see why that would even be a question unless the other groups wanted to merge with us. It would be like, we would be the bullies in that situation, trying to force people to get onto our team when they're perfectly happy on their own team. And especially like with the Grand United Order, their ritual is older than ours. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to come join us? Like if anything, their ritual takes precedent. So I, I don't see any need to, amalgam make this mishmash of odd fellowship that's one odd fellowship for the whole world it's it's allowed to be different and for whatever region or culture or any of that i i think it's beautiful that there's different approaches to the kind of the same odd animal i agree with that i and i think that we can support each other i would really Mm -hmm. like to see some sort of official acknowledgement between the grand united order and the independent order you know we don't have to share ritual we don't have to share regalia we don't have to share any of the way that we do things but acknowledging that relationship between the two it opens the door for us to be able to strengthen what they do and for them to be able to strengthen what we do I love having contacts with the Grand United Order. I love the individual members that I have met and that I've Mm -hmm. learned so much from. Um, I love watching the progress of Northern Star Lodge 715 in Syracuse, New York. Yeah. Could you imagine a group of independent order odd fellows coming together with almost nothing, raising money, buying a building, and outfitting it as a lodge hall? I mean, we're seeing that to a certain extent with the new lodges that we have here, but they're also starting in many cases with more resources because the Grand Lodges still have a reserve of things like regalia that they can hand out. And so to to watch the way in which these brothers have embraced the mission of Odd Fellowship and started working to build this lodge in Syracuse, New York, that is so thrilling to me. I love watching that. Uh, and I would like to see some kind of official recognition. You know, maybe it's like the first phone call of the Sovereign Grand Master after his uh, installation is to the Grand United Order or something like that. Some sort of official acknowledgement because we owe a lot to the common roots of Odd Fellowship. And that is a great way to honor that. I, I agree. I think that's, you know, definitely something that is long, long, long overdue. And I love that there's so many members becoming double odds. I can't wait for the day that I can become a double odd. I think that's that that pattern is what's going to push the charge through to get that official recognition between the organizations that really should have been there all along yeah yeah and i think one of the great things about that is it's easy to see where the grand united order is still strong but i keep learning these amazing things about other places where the grand united order existed for example here in america we know they were big in the southeast because that's where the vast majority of their members were, you know, it was the African Americans uh, who joined the Grand United Order and built their own communities. But they traveled around the country. Just recently, I found out about Golden City Lodge, which was in Helena, Montana. 
Now, you wouldn't think hmm. there would be a lot of demand for an African-American fraternal order in Helena, Montana, because there are not a lot of African-Americans there. But in fact, there were enough that dignitaries came to their sort of opening gala that they had from all over. They had people from Seattle. They had people from oh, wow. all over the mountain states and even as far away as Minneapolis. They came to Helena to celebrate the chartering of that Grand United Order Lodge. And it shows the the incredible breadth and resiliency of that community that the Grand United Order was useful and needed in Helena, Montana. Yeah. Preach. You got yeah. a whole you got yeah. a whole choir on this call. And I, I yeah. think uh I, I think people who are listening to us are 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 doing what just uh uh what I've forgotten your name. Ainsley. What Ainsley says. <laughs> it says it right there. Uh, I always like, called him Josh. I always called him Josh. I did. I did. But I, I agree. I think the uh I think the idea that we have to that we have to just join up because somebody asked why not mm -hmm. it's important to ask why not because those are the questions that we asked in the first half of the show is we said what if and those are the mm -hmm. questions that we just we there are some that just fit really well that maybe not yet maybe mm -hmm. not yet and it is probably a time when there's a, a convergence and I think in the independent order, there's a chance for more than a convergence. It's actually the opposite within our own order. So, hey, let's just see where that rolls. And then uh, we, we get to a possible, hey, everyone's back in one happy family again. Um, but uh, we were one happy family because there really was no other happy family. There, you know, mm -hmm. there, was, there was two unhappy families. Um, in the 1700s and maybe yeah. even more, but um, you know, it's funny. I jump a, a little bit about the, the, the Muscovite story, you know, like the story that Seth told about the breakups and the, yeah, there's your Fez or your Busby, um, yeah, your, good. your break, the breakups and the marriages that were going on in that. And that's just a side gig. Like that wasn't the main meat of the, of the dinner. Um, so yeah, I can, I can imagine that we would have a very difficult time. Um, so, but you're right. We have to acknowledge first, yeah. uh, but I think any kind of merge is it's easy to say, why not? And it's like, mm, there's a lot of reasons why it's just going to take some time. I think just the fact that there is no one way to be an odd fellow should be enough. It's the beauty of it. That Which is, is the exactly reason right. why there's there's lodges like yours, there's lodges yeah. like mine, and there's lodges like the ones. I um, love the diversity of seeing how different odd fellows odd fellow. I, I I don't like when I see odd fellows cutting each other down about what they wear, like in the photos. You know, members will be you know harping on dress code and things like that. That's your lodge. That's how you do things in your lodge. How I do things in my lodge or how I want to do things in, that's how my members want to be. And if another lodge wants to, as long as we're all going by the code and we're following the rules and there's a lot of wiggle room in the rules, which is part of the beauty of it. That gives a lot of freedom for everybody to be their own odd fellow and for every lodge to be their own lodge. And I think when you start dictating what you think odd fellowship should be and then taking it a step further by almost demanding that other odd fellow organizations dismantle their history and their legacy simply to be under an umbrella, I think is a ridiculous, very ridiculous notion. And it's, there's a whole other lot of words for that too, but that's yeah that's all i'm going to say about that i i think it's beautiful to have separate orders you know i there's room for it and like you said there are different ways to be an odd fellow i've had the opportunity to travel and visit different lodges in different jurisdictions 
And although we all have the same basic ritual and the same basic rules, each jurisdiction has its own constitution and its own customs, its own ways of doing things. Like when I visited Humboldt Lodge 138 in Rochester, New York, 20 years ago, or almost 20 years ago, they did the Pledge of Allegiance in a different place in the order of business. Hmm. And they did things differently in that lodge. It's still odd fellowship. I still recognized it very much. I still knew exactly what to do, but it was a different kind of experience. And just as we can have those different experiences and appreciate them within the independent order, we can have that with our brother, uncle, and cousin organizations. I don't exactly know how you'd work out the familial mm -hmm. lines between the Independent Order, Manchester Unity, and Grand United Order, just to say that we're all related. And we all have beautiful, unique things about how we proceed with Odd Fellowship. I don't want any of those groups to have to lose that because of some idea of a three-way shotgun marriage yeah. that we have to have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think that also falls in line with the sentiment that a lot of members have about collapsing all the branches into one as well, is that they all have their place in their role, even though that might be a diminished role at, at this point in history, there's no need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, I mean... All of the branches of Odd Fellowship, they have a role. They have something to do. Now, in some places, I know that it's atrophied to the point that there's so little difference between what the seven lodges in a jurisdiction and the two encampments may do that it becomes hard to see. It's like, why do we still have these encampments? Why do we still have the Patriarch's Militant? Why do we still have Rebecca's? Well, they each have something different and unique to offer. They each have... Um, really beautiful, wonderful traditions and lessons. And when we get back up to larger membership numbers, as I expect that we will eventually, we will have a need for those places to go. I hope yeah. that in Victoria, you have to establish a degree lodge because you have so many people joining that you need to start coordinating amongst the lodges to have initiatory ceremonies run by a degree lodge where everybody from the lodges comes together and the degree lodge is initiating people. I'd love for you to have an encampment up there. Yeah. Uh, I would love to have those functions reemerge organically from within the organization. I was going to be a little rougher on my comment about it. And I was just going to say, if you want to know why, you know, you, you need encampment and why you need the patriarch, um, just grow your com jurisdiction, grow your jurisdiction. You'll find out why it'll, mm -hmm. it'll be yeah. right in front of your face real fast. Oh yeah. We got a whole bunch of people. Instead of five people that cared about doing yeah. more research, you're at 25 people. Now, what do you do with them? They're all demanding it. Oh, well, we just happen to have this tool in the tool. And once box. you take it away, oh, you can't yeah. bring it back. That's right. That's it's right. this little encampment tool and we should, we should probably pull it out of the toolbox every once yeah. in a while, but you're right. If you throw it away, then it's like, well, now you got, now you've it's lost gone. the gap. It's the gap of mm -hmm. understanding what to do. So you have to like our jurisdiction, um, you need to go and find the one encampment left, or you need to go to, a, you need to go to a, a neighboring jurisdiction to find it. Yeah. As soon as they open the border, you know, we'll come <laughs> up and, uh, I know we're having Help a big party. It's a big party. It's a big yes. party. A lot of hugging. A lot, right. of, a lot of that. <laughs> so close. Yeah. If Josh so is close. kissing everybody, I'm Josh wearing a mask. That everybody. night. <laughs> no offense, Josh. It's just uh, uh, Josh. You, Josh you might have cooties. He's so a I have lover. To be he, he, yeah, he's he's trouble. He's trouble. Well, I think that brings us uh, probably to our last question of looking forward. This may be the hardest one of all. And uh, that is, how can Odd Fellowship stay relevant in the world of digital media? Because right now we've experienced uh, a little over a year now where things have to be done not in person. You have to use a computer to bring people together. Now, on the good side, it's given birth to these two wonderful podcasts because we were all sitting around going, yeah, let's do a podcast about Odd Fellowship. 
But on the other hand, it is really hard to take an organization that is predicated on in-person debate and voting, which requires two signatures on every check, <clears throat> and putting them in the age of Venmo and PayPal. Yeah. Um, so when I looked at this question, my my reaction was, I think we can manage business because we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to do it digitally and um, you know, electronic transfers and double signing and DocuSign and all these things have are, are in existence before and now COVID just made them more more obvious to more people. I think the thing that's going to be the hard part is how do we sustain sustain a, um, a a relationship of odd fellows to each other in a digital world instead of just hey we're out there like we talked about before with advertising or technology or hey uh, treasurer you just push this button and it gets sent to the two signatures and then the electronic transfer goes to the maintenance company i mean like that stuff all happens because this stuff happens everywhere else in the world i think the staying relevant when we're just facebook pages or we're just uh, meeting digitally or we have more members meeting digitally like that that is one fear i have is that we will lose that um like just this phone call, right? You're, there's three of us here. When, when you're on a Zoom meeting with 25 members, there's one person talking. There isn't somebody necessarily leaning over and whispering in the in this person sitting next to their ear going, what the hell's going on? Or, <laughs> Why is this an issue? Is this just their issue or is this everybody's issue, right? Like, we, I think the digital is is stripping us of the real connect and the and the the intimacy that we need in Odd Fellows to be friends and to be, um, you know, more productive. I don't know how you stay relevant. Yeah. It's just a puzzle to me. I think I think to answer that question or the what you just said, Billy, that if people instead of whispering, I think what they're doing on the Zoom calls is they're just texting the other person, <laughs> being like, yeah. "What are we doing?" <laughs> um, but I, I think probably a hybrid approach is what will work best because there are aspects of Odd Fellowship that are inherently in person that it's the point, the coming together, the, you know, being in a sacred space together where the world outside world is shut out is the point for a lot of what we do. But there's also a lot of what we do that we don't need to do it the old fashioned way because there are easier, more efficient ways to do it. Like, using a PayPal or a Venmo or whatever, you know, versus, you know, writing checks to pay the power bill. So I, I definitely feel like uh, there, there's a kind of a hand in hand of the technology and the in-person that we can harmonize in a way that it doesn't strip away anything from what we're doing tradition wise as odd fellows or the in-person experience that we're, we're starving for at this point um well, i would add something to that i think one of the ways we stay relevant with digital media is by augmenting the lodge experience obviously the core is and always will be and always should be the in-person experience getting together hanging out with your lodge brothers and sisters doing the work of the lodge going to the meetings learning having that activity but we also know that not everybody's able to make it to every meeting. There are things that come up in life. And so it's easy to get disengaged from your lodge when it's only the in-person events. By having the lodge Facebook page where we take pictures and show what happened at the last meeting, or we show what happened when we did the tree planting, or we show what happened um, in various other 
things that we've done. We show what happened at the district meeting. We show pictures of what happened at Grand Lodge. It keeps people engaged in a way that I think will augment what we're doing in our actual lodges. I think that's very possible. I also think, and this is something where I'm going to give you a great deal of credit, Ainsley, you understand this in a really fundamental way, which is that Odd Fellowship has a history of visual communication, and that is perfect for the modern world. There could not possibly be a better fraternal order for Instagram. Mm -hmm. We have the most cool stuff to look at. Yes. Yes, you know, we it's do. Not, it's not just checkerboard rugs that you roll out in the lodge hall and things like that. We have genuinely cool things. The beautiful old regalia, um, the beautiful old buildings that we used to have, uh, the artwork, you know, some of the folk art that's been made, some of the official stuff that's been done, the beautiful lithographs, the big old paintings of the voyage from Jerusalem to Jericho, all of that stuff. We are so well suited to visual communication, which is the perfect medium when everyone is carrying around a smartphone. I would like to see more of our lodges embrace that, have more lodges where members take pictures and put them on the lodge Instagram feed and really show off Odd Fellowship. I know that in my jurisdiction here in Washington, we've gotten members from what I've posted on Instagram. People see it and they go, what is that? And I say, awesome. well, let me tell you about Odd Fellowship. <laughs> and they join. They uh, they join. It works yeah. to continue to, to show the visual message. I mean, remember, 150 years ago, Odd Fellowship was the way that a lot of illiterate, mostly uneducated manual laborers learned about the world they learned about things beyond just their household. They learned about uh, humanity. They learned stories from the Bible. They learned all of these things that were outside the realm of daily life. And we were perfectly set up to teach it through signs and symbols. Well, we can easily pick that mission up and carry it onto social media now and do a really, really good job of it. You know, I think uh, running the Odd Fellows Instagram account, Ainsley, you've done a fantastic job. You're always out there looking for things that other people post about Odd Fellowship and getting them headed in the right direction for the things that they need to know about us. I go through, like, I mean, maybe not every single day, but maybe like every couple days, I'll go through the IOOF tag and the Odd Fellows tag. And I will click like on every image or I'll try to comment on something or like give a little nugget. Like if they post like a Goliath head for sale or something for some ridiculous price, like yeah. I'll give them a nugget of information. I'll be like, we still use these. If a lodge has one in con good condition, we use these during the first degree. Or if there's a robe, I'll be like, oh, this is a scene bearer robe. We still use this because it's part of our living history and explain that these antiques that you're selling aren't just antiques that are dead relics. We actually still use the antiques because this is all we got and try to sell people on the idea that, hey, that is cool. You want to learn how to play with it and actually yeah. learn what it means and get a little bit something more out of it than just have it be a cool wall hanger. And I feel like just kind of educating people a little bit more about it. And then like, hopefully they'll follow the page back or somebody that follows that page might see my comment and follow the odd fellows back. And I feel like it's like that one-on-one -on -one educational engagement is where I feel the most comfortable as opposed to making blanket missives about how wonderful we are and the, you know, more, I'm not a very bombastic horn tutor really. I feel like it's more like, you kind of like nudge people and let them discover it for themselves is yeah, keep, the best approach. Keep reminding them, let them know it's yeah. always there. Yeah. Well, I think this has been a fantastic discussion about uh, where we have been in the past and where we're going. I want to thank uh, brother Billy from Columbia number two in Victoria, British Columbia for coming up with this great idea for the crossover episode 
and uh, for helping us get it all organized. He's doing all of the uh, producing and engineering for both episodes tonight, and we super appreciate that. <laughs> now, for the next yeah, episode... Yeah. He's like, I was supposed to be recording this? What? Yeah, I, should, I didn't push record yet. <laughs> uh, Tell the, me when we're going to start. This is the part that you edit out later. <laughs> <laughs> we we like to try and sound professional we know we're not but we like to try and sound that way well toby you are a professional well, I am, <laughs> the ability yes. to try to sound professional you can you can tell by the 600 hundred dollar radio microphone here in front of me yeah and you can tell from what usually is a room full of uh foam uh furniture cushions yes i've absorbed the uh the sound in my little office here yes <laughs> Well, in the next episode of the Three Links Oddcast, we've got yet another episode about a new lodge. I know, it's there are so many new lodges They're in They're fantastic. Fellowship. They're fantastic episodes, Toby. I love mm -hmm. every one of them. They're fantastic. Yeah, There's to anybody so out many... there who says Odd Fellowship is dead, y'all are dead wrong. Not true, not true. That's right. New lodges just keep popping up like dandelions on the lawn. Yeah. And so we're going to be talking to... Uh, Really, the uh, the creator, uh, the driving force behind the newest lodge in Thermopolis, Wyoming, Brother Braden Harvey, is going to be joining us for our next episode. So, everyone, uh, keep your ears peeled for that one. And uh, on behalf of myself, Brother Ainsley, and Brother Billy Sanderson from the Modern Goat Rider podcast, we would like to thank all of you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>